Well, I'm reminded of my need for Jesus because my mortality is quickly running out. I'm blind and old, and I can't see anything. <laughs> I'm going to do the best that I can. Well, we're here to celebrate King Jesus. And uh, I could tell you that um, I can't... You can put your candles out, actually. That'd be kind of cool. I'm going to let it shine. What do you think, man? Does that help? That helps a little bit, man. Thanks, Sam. Give Sam a round, huh? Yeah. All right. Awesome. You know, um, I can't speak of any other church. Uh, this is the only one that I go to. And uh, I can just say that uh, for every Christian church that's out there, they, they, they do, they'll tell you that they base their, their existence and their function on this book. And I believe that if they're a, a real Christian church, then that is the case. But it's a big book, and, and you, can, uh, you can read a lot of different things in there, and, and you can preach about a whole lot of different things. And certain things grab people's passions, right? Uh, but I, I could just speak of this church. Our, one of our deep rooted passions is to, to understand who Jesus Christ is. If we're to worship him well, we need, we need some truth about who Jesus is. And so uh, week in and week out here at our church, that's what we do. We pursue the person of Jesus Christ. If we learn who he is and what he taught and what he did, and then some of the, you guys know, you, you all probably, myself included, we all have things that we think are biblical and they're just really not, you know? And, and so one of the things that we like to do here is to pursue God word and find out exactly what it says about Jesus, what he taught, what he said, what he did, who he is, who you are in him. That's super important. And so um, this week is not going to be any different. It is Christmas. It's a big day. We're celebrating a king. And, 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 and last week, uh, we, we pursued the person of Jesus this way. Maybe you remember uh, those of you that were here last week. If you were here at church last week, this is your, this is your moment to shine. I'm gonna, I didn't cue you on this, but I hope you pick up on this because we want to show the rest of the folks that are just visiting with us uh, what it means to be part of this church. And what I mean by that is that you listen and you learn and you grow. Listen, last week we spoke of this verse, Zechariah 9 9, and I'm not gonna, I'm, not, I'm just cueing you right here. Ready, Revolution folks? We said that we should rejoice and shout in triumph. Your king is coming. Yes. We should shout in triumph. It's the winning team. We, uh, we celebrate a great, great king. You know, there's been a lot of great kings in the past, over the years. Um, I jotted down just a few of them. You guys might remember some of them. Uh, how about Alexander the Great? Did you ever hear of him? Uh, he ruled over in Greece uh, way back in like the 340 B.C. time. Uh, and then how about this? Hey, you remember this? Steve, Steve Martin? Who's this? King Tut. You remember him? Come on. You guys remember him? Am I aging myself? The rest of you old folks, you remember King Tut, right? Steve Martin? Well, he, he reigned. He was the, the king of Egypt way, 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 way back, 1330 B.C., right around there. Um, how about King David? You guys ever heard of King David? Guy, he fought Goliath, you know, the big giant dude, and he whooped him with a rock. You remember him? You remember him? Go, Caleb! After uh, King David kind of came and went, then his son, you all remember uh, King Solomon? King Solomon was, uh, many people believe that he was the wealthiest and smartest person who ever lived. He did not kill anybody. Would you like a microphone, Caleb? Come on, brother, preach. He was uh, way back in like 970 to 930 BC. We've had, uh, we have our own kings here in, in America, don't we? We got Elvis. We got Arnold Palmer. We got Michael Jackson, the king of pop. But there's one king that's high and lifted up. 
that's above all other kings. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that's who we're here to celebrate tonight. One king. You know, oh, it's amazing. There's a lot of amazing things about Jesus, but I find this to be amazing. You know, I'm sure you agree, like, time kind of dulls things. Um, can anyone with real honesty tell me if they remember any birthday gift you got in 2010? How about this? What did you have for lunch three Thursdays ago? You can honestly remember? Is he telling the truth back there, Tabitha? He's close enough, isn't he? My point is that time dulls things, doesn't it? I don't know, is, is Granny here tonight? She's in the car. She's been in the car. What, is she waiting on Pap Pap? It's an inside joke, you, you guys would understand. But, but uh, I don't want to pick on her because she's not able to hear. But did she hear me? Hi, Granny. You guys want to say hello to Granny? Hi, Granny. Hey. Granny is 91 years old. So I would venture to say she's probably the oldest person here. Did a little math this week. We're talking about time dulling things, right? You know that when she wakes up on her 92nd birthday, she will have had 33,216 mornings. Think about that for a second. 33,000. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 33,216, that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot of mornings. Well, I did a little math. You know, Jesus was born over 2,000 years ago. But the thing that's amazing about Jesus is this. If you, take, if you do a little math, and you multiply 2,000 by 365 days, it's been 700 and 30,000 days ago, over 730,000 days ago, in a little town that from where you sit is 6,555 miles from here. And even though it was that long ago and that far away, for some reason, you're all sitting here in this parking lot to celebrate, worship, and honor him. And you're, you're just a few amongst countless millions of people around the globe right now that have this angst and this longing and this need to gather in places to celebrate a king that was born over 730,000 days ago. That is amazing to me. Tonight's message is called The Unexpected King. I'm going to give you a little history behind this Jesus. You know, Israel, way, way back in his day, it was oppressed by the Roman Empire. You remember the Roman Empire. There were some gnarly dudes. For hundreds of years, they oppressed uh, the Jewish people. And the only power and control that the Jewish people had was that power and control that Rome gave them. It was 40 BC that the Roman Empire decided that they were going to give Israel a little bit of control and they appointed King Herod as king of the Jews. Well this king was not really much of a king at all. He's a puppet king if you think about it because he was appointed by Rome and therefore he's controlled by Rome. Now in this context of being oppressed for 250 years with some joke of a king who really had no power, here's the people of Israel in this oppression. And you have to understand that 
they all were very, very aware of these ancient prophecies of their own prophets from way back that said that someday a deliverer, a Messiah, a king would come and deliver them to freedom from their oppressors. And so certainly after all these years, there was, they were ready for, for this powerful king to, to, to grant them freedom, to rise up amongst the ranks of the Jewish people. This is what they expected. You know, history kind of forms our, our idea and our reality about a king. Think about a king for a second. Most kings find their throne in just a few different ways. Sometimes all of the people would, would gather around one man and say, this is our guy, and we will appoint you king. Now lead us. So they'd step into their throne. Or some other time they'd take the throne by force. But not by force, like by might, but by succession, right? My, my dad was the king. So whether you all like it or not, I'm the king now. Do you like that? I don't care. I'm the king. Or sometimes men would take the throne by force. They'd go into a city or into a nation with their army, and they'd say, I'm going to kill your king, and now I'm king. Do you like that? I don't care if you like it. I'm the king. They would take the throne by force. And so certainly Israel was looking for their man to come up out of the ranks and free them and take the throne by force. And so it's a bit unexpected to the common man or woman whose idea of a king has been formed by history to look at the story of Jesus and see that when the wise men came from the east and they arrived in Jerusalem to see and to worship this newborn king of the Jews, it's kind of unexpected, but he wasn't found in a house of nobility or a house of royalty. He wasn't found in a palace and he wasn't found in a castle. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, the historical narrative of the scriptures tells us something quite different. What it tells us is that these wise men looked up and they saw a star. Can you look up? You see any stars at all? There's one. You've got to look at it for a minute. There's a little bit of cloud cover, but can you focus in on a star? I see a lot of them too, Jackson. But you see, it's no different than most nights. You know, we look up and we see a point of light. It's a star. But there was something that was interesting that day. That day, one of these stars that's just sitting right there and, and our eyes are drawn to this point of light. All of a sudden, this star began to move across the sky. And all the other ones stayed kind of the way they were. But this one star started to move across the sky. And the wise men wanted to go see Jesus because that's what smart people do. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yes. So they followed the star. And all of a sudden, this star that normally would draw our eyes to its light, it moved and it shined its light down on a home where the king was. Someone say, that's a miracle. Yes. Science can't explain that. I can't explain that, so don't ask me. It's a miracle. And this light shined down like a spotlight on this little home in this little town of Bethlehem, right next to this little barn where the king was born. And so begins the pattern of Jesus Christ not living up to expectations. Now before you rush the stage and say, you're a blasphemer and Christ is sufficient, yeah, I get it. It's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that Christ often doesn't live up to your expectations or mine. Don't we all have expectations about Jesus? Here, when I was thinking about this, when, when we all, if you're a Christian now or you're not quite there yet, you will be. But we all come to Jesus with these expectations. We all come with either, it's a small group of people. It's not too many different groups in this, in this 
group of people. There's either the people that know nothing about Jesus. I mean nothing about Jesus. They'll go their whole life and nobody talks to them about Jesus at all. Say, that's sad. We got to do better. Oh, we got to say, we got to do better about that. We got to do better. Say it out loud, Eric. We got to do better, don't we? We got to tell people about Jesus. There's people that don't know Jesus at all. And then there's some, these are, those aren't the dangerous ones. The ones that are dangerous, they have enough hearsay knowledge about Jesus to be wrong about a lot of things. They hear things from their aunt, their uncle, and their grandma. They may have even heard some stuff about Jesus on the guys on TV that are asking for money all the time. That's dangerous. And so we have these people, we have expectations about who Jesus is, and it's not based on fact. And until God's word becomes an integral part of your life, we don't have realistic expectations of Jesus Christ. I don't know about your expectations of Jesus, but... I just kind of listed a few of them down. Uh, Luke 1, I can't read this real well, but Luke 1.33 says that his kingdom is eternal. And, and Luke 18.36 says that his kingdom is unlike all other earthly kingdoms. So we can't compare him to all the other kings that have taken thrones. It says in Luke 1.21 that he would forgive sin. In Luke 2.6 that he would be our shepherd. In Matthew 11.28 that... He said, those who are weary and carry heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. That's who Jesus says he is. Those are expectations that Jesus is welcoming you to levy upon him. But don't bring your own. But instead of letting him set expectations for us, we try to set them for him. Folks have all kinds of expectations of Jesus. I'd like to dispel some of them this evening, and I'd like to speak the truth to you about who Jesus Christ is. And, and in so doing, it'll shape who we are. It'll shape how we live. It'll shape how we worship Him. And that's what I'd like to do tonight. So the first thing I jotted down, if you want to, you can too, it's this, Jesus, Jesus is going to heal me. Jesus wants to heal everyone. Yes. Wrong. See, we look and we heard stories of Jesus healing all kinds of people in Scripture, right? The, the blind could see, and the lepers were cleansed, and, and the sick were healed, and the dead were raised to new life. So he's going to heal me by his stripes. We are healed, right? Well, yes. His shed blood and his death on the cross heals us of our sin problem. Absolutely. For all of those who have embraced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then your sin problem has been cured. The sin that you were born with has been cleansed from you. And the power that sin has over you to control your actions is dead. And the destiny that sin has for you to send you to an eternity away from God is dead. You are alive in Christ. But not all sickness and disease will be healed. Sometimes illness and even terminal illness isn't to be healed. But Jesus uses it for a purpose. For a purpose. Many of you know my friend Pat. Most of you don't. It was years ago that my friend Pat Walsh, who was in his 40s, was diagnosed with cancer. And he loved the Lord. He was a church-going guy. He prayed. He studied the scriptures. And he begged the Lord to heal him of cancer. But he never did. I was called to the hospital when at 46 years old, he was going to enjoy his last day. <clears throat> I 
I watched that man share Jesus with his very last bit of energy with his nurses. Not really understanding why he wasn't healed. But he loved the Lord and he shared Jesus with everyone who walked into that room. And on the, the day before he died, he said, Moses, I'd like for you to go to the store for me and get me a chocolate cake because we're going to have a party. And we're going to celebrate because I'm going to see my king. So I went down to the store and I got him a chocolate cake. What am I going to do? Say no, right? <clears throat> and we went back to the room and that man was so weak that I had to feed him his cake. And I had to bring the cup up to his mouth to put the straw in his mouth so he could take a drink. He was that weak. Shortly after that, he passed. Now, I don't understand all that. But I can tell you that I learned how to live by watching him die. And to this day, inside my Bible... I have Pat's pictures to inspire me to keep going. To remind me that sometimes I just don't understand the things of God. Paul said, I, who can understand the thoughts of God? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. <clears throat> sometimes sickness is not always healed. I miss him. Maybe some of you have heard of a, a woman, her name is Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny Erickson Tata, at the age of 18, dove off of a little dock in the middle of a lake, just playing with her friends. She didn't realize that the water was real shallow there, and she hit her head, broke her, her spinal cord, and from that moment on now, she's in her late 60s. She has never moved except from here up. I listened to her testimony one time, and it was moving. For all these years, she loved the Lord, and she has begged and pleaded with the Lord to please heal me. Please heal me, believing that she would be healed. But she never was. But you know, to this day, that woman has graced the stages of churches and convention halls and conference centers and shared the good news of Jesus Christ with millions of people. And thousands and thousands of people have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of who she is. And that is platform she may never have gotten if she received the healing that she so desperately asked for. I met another man recently, this was just a couple years ago, his name is Dave Ring. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dave Ring, but back in 1953, he didn't look like that, he was born. And on the day he was born, his parents were surprised to find out that he was born dead. And for eight minutes, think about that. If I stopped speaking right now, and it was complete silence for eight minutes, it would seem like a lifetime, wouldn't it? For eight minutes, that baby was absolutely dead. No heartbeat, no brain activity, nothing. And as the doctors were filling out his birth, his death certificate, all of a sudden, beep, 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 the heart monitor started going, and he came alive. Miracle. The doctor said, if this beep, 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 beep continues, the very best you can expect is an absolute vegetable for the rest of his life, if he lives at all. He's now got to be 70. And he loves the Lord. And he, 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 is, he is so messed up because of that eight minutes of no oxygen to the brain and to his body that he drools all over himself. And he can hardly walk. But he, get, he has been on thousands 
of church stages and led thousands of people into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus. So, see, he didn't get healed all these years. I want to be healed. I want to be healed. He hasn't been healed. But his illness, God used it for a purpose. And it was for God's glory, not for Dave's. And because of God's glory, he let him stay like this. And God used him to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And thousands of people have come to know Jesus because of Dave Ring. You know, the great apostle Paul, he had some ailment. And no one really knows what it is. Christians fight about it. That's what we do. They fight about what his ailment was. It says that it was a thorn in the side that the devil had given him. Like, I don't know if it was like a thorn from a thorn bush or if it was just some type of, I don't know what it was because, you know, the scriptures don't exactly say what it is. So, you know, just, it's a thorn in the side. All right? If God wanted us to know what it was, do you think he would have told us? Yeah, he, he would have. And I think he didn't tell us because we could put anything in the blank and realize that Paul, this great, amazing man of faith, the guy who wrote half the New Testament, who planted 14 churches, one of the greatest Christians to ever live, he asked God three times in prayer, please, Lord, take away this thorn. And each time, God said, nope, my grace is sufficient. The fact that I have saved you is more than enough. You can't pray away every illness. It goes against what God's word says. Let me read this to you if I could read it. It's kind of dark. Hebrews 127, I believe it is, or 927. Each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Someday, this is a good place for an amen, someday the Lord Jesus is coming back. Amen. And one day the clouds are going to open up, and Jesus, the King of glory, is going to come through the clouds and gather up his bride. Now, if that day comes while you're still breathing, amen. But if it doesn't, you're going to die. No matter what you think, you're going to die. We can't always expect that Jesus is going to heal every single person of every ailment because someone told you so. That's unrealistic expectations on Jesus Christ. Folks also expect Jesus to prosper them greatly. Let me just tell you something about Jesus. He's not some like heavenly Charles Schwab financial advisor. He's not some genie who you can rub the, the bottle, the lamp, and get all the money that you want. Let me tell you who Jesus Christ really is in this area of prosperity. Matthew 6.33 says that God already knows all your needs. Does anybody out here have any needs? Raise your hand if you have needs. Okay. So the scriptures would tell us that God already knows all that. He, he wasn't waiting for you to go, oh, oh, you had a need. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Now let me, let's get some angels over there or something to help him. I didn't know. No, that's not, what's, that's not the case. The truth is that God already knows all your needs. And in Matthew 6, he says, if you will seek first my kingdom, right? That means if the first priority of your life isn't your prosperity, but the first priority of your life is seeking the relationship with Jesus. And then seeing with every bit of your effort, not a little bit, not just on weekends, but the biggest priority of your life, if the biggest priority of your life is to seek a relationship with Him and to help others to seek that same relationship and to be like Him, He said He will meet all those needs. That's awesome! That's awesome. But he, see, here, here, here's the problem. There's this sovereign king of the universe that desires to help you. I'm not saying he doesn't want to prosper you. There's a sovereign king. Let's, 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 shape, let's, let's craft it this way. 
if there's a sovereign king of the universe that actually desires to help you in certain ways, would that be good? Yes. Everyone? Yes. Okay. So, therefore, wouldn't you want to know how he wants to help you and then what you need to do to get that help? Isn't that what you want? I mean, I'm just, it's a hypothetical question. If there is a God that is sovereign and wants to help you, wouldn't you want to know what he wants to help you with and then know how to get it? Everyone? Some of you just saying nothing, like, no, I don't want that. I'm good. Okay, so here's the problem. When we levy un unrealistic expectations upon Jesus. The problem with these unmet expectations is that when this Jesus doesn't meet that expectation that you've put on him, we have a tendency to stop believing that he hears you, that he's even real, or maybe you start thinking he doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me. I'm beyond help. These are awful lies from hell. Okay? He does love you, and he does want to help you. And so we can't levy these unrealistic expectations on him because they are going to fail. And when they fail, you start throwing the real Jesus out. And that's dangerous. Jesus meets you in your need, not in your greed. Someone tweet that. <laughs> Folks also expect Jesus to fix all their problems and remove all their negative circumstances in life. Oh, just come to Jesus and everything will be just fine. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Yeah. I feel like stomping in here. Yeah, except that's not true, too. So here's what God's Word says. This, this is Jesus himself speaking. He said, In this life you shall have trials, sorrow, and tribulation. Now, to me, that's a little negative. I threw in all the different versions just to make a point. It's not always going to be awesome. But he goes on in that same verse. He's, he lowers the boom. He's like, in this life you'll have trials, tribulation, sorrow, but be of good cheer. Take heart. Everyone raise their hand up one time. I want you to do something with me. I want you to do something with me. Ready? But I have overcome. Go this. Overcome. Over, over the top, right? I have overcome the world. What is he saying? He's saying in this life, all this nasty stuff's going to happen. But I have, I'm, I'm up over this thing. Come on now, I'm up over this thing. I have overcome the world. Like all this stuff's still happening. And I'm not letting it stop me. I'm, I'm still on my mission. I'm still who I am. I'm still the king of glory. I'm still the sovereign king. Things are, things are rough, and you guys are going to have it. But take, take good heart. I have overcome the world. You know, people who think that when Jesus saves you, that he's going to take away all of your negative stuff? Dude, really? Jesus is the poster child of unmet expectations. He is the poster child of circumstances that didn't go away. They put him on a cross. He was innocent. They whipped him, they beat him, they spit on him, they slapped him, they stripped him naked, and they killed him. I shared this with my church family last night. I was reading just the other day. I don't even remember where it was. It was in Luke somewhere. I like Luke. Jesus was preaching in a temple. And the religious people got so mad, they formed a mob. They were coming after him. Now just think for a second. Let's just pretend for a second that I was Jesus and I'm so far from that, but just pretend for a second. And let's just say that 
At, at the end of this music stuff right here is a cliff that drops off 100 feet. And I started saying stuff to you that made you so mad that you all got up out of your seat and you started ganging up around me and yelling and throwing stones at me and threatening to kill me and gathered around me. Well, I'm one dude and you have a lot of people here and, I, and you forced me to the edge of the cliff because you wanted to kill me for what I was saying. I was reading that story about Jesus. That's what they did. And it said he passed right through them and went on his way. That's a miracle, right? I don't even understand. That freaks me out, right? But it, it teaches me. It teaches me. Because in danger, he just walked right through them. And just, I love it. He said, he just went on his way. See y'all. <laughs> just so cool. You know what that taught me? That taught me that Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. He wanted to for you. He didn't have to. He wanted to. He loves you. says of Jesus on the cross, the book of Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. First and foremost, you know, going to the cross wouldn't have been fun. Anyone volunteer for a crucifixion tonight? We're going to make this real. Yeah, I didn't think so. It wouldn't be fun to be crucified, tortured to death, right? The joy set before him. Oh, he knew that beyond the cross... Something good was going to be there. You know what that was? Raise your hand. It's you. He did that because beyond the cross, he was going to spend eternity with you guys. And because of that, it said that he endured the cross. That means he didn't come off of it. He didn't go running away from it. He didn't shy away from it in any way. He endured the cross. He didn't pray it away. He didn't run like a little baby. And he didn't call down angels to rip him off of there and say, I'm done and smite everybody. He stayed on the cross on his own free will. Why? Disregarding its shame. That's overcoming the world. He, he, he was on the cross. Some experts think he literally was naked. Not even the loincloth. Like, naked. Because that's what Rome would do. To really embarrass someone so that they would say, Hey, you want this? Make me mad and we'll do that to you. So they would strip him down naked. So here's Jesus on the cross. Bad day? Yes. But he said he disregarded the shame. You say, look at all this bad circumstance going on right now. And he disregarded it. It was like, yeah, this is no big deal. Imagine that. On the cross, naked, dying for everyone to see. An innocent man. Disregarding the shame. Like, I love the choice of words. He's like, yeah, it's no big deal. Were the circumstances still there? Did the cross go away? Not at all. He endured the cross and he disregarded its shame. Say, overcome. Come on, let's see the hand. Overcome. Overcome. Maybe this will help you. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who trust or hope in the Lord will find new strength. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean like more of the same strength that you have. No, this is a new strength, something supernatural that gives you the ability to do what it says next. It says, you won't fall, you'll soar high on wings like eagles. Look at this, right up here, right? Overcome. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So he doesn't say that all the circumstances are going to go away because of Jesus. He gives you strength to what? Overcome overcome all this stuff. It's like shaking it off, right? When all the circumstances come, just like a duck when it has water on its back, what does it do? It shakes it off. And that's what Jesus gives you the power to do. Shake it off. He's not going to take it all away. He's going to give you strength, a strength you've never had before, a supernatural strength to overcome the situation. That's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus. You know, uh, the cross, don't listen to the devil, you listen to Jesus, okay? Listen up, listen up. Jesus is still king. Jesus had, his circumstances were way worse than yours. He's still king. He's still on the throne. He is still sovereign. He is still building his church. He is still on mission right now. And he is here. 
that the cross and the circumstances didn't alter him at all. He is still king of the universe. That's Jesus Christ. You know, here, here, here's some more. In Romans 8, right, I was reading this this week. In Romans 8, Paul says of, of the believer, this is the stuff that you're going to experience, right? He says you're going to experience trouble, calamity, persecution, hunger. You're going to feel destitute. There's going to be danger and even death. Like he doesn't say because you're a Christian that you're not going to experience those things. And the person would come to you and say, if you just embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior, everything's going to get better. And you'll take away all your negative stuff. Just pray and they'll take it away. That's not true. This book was written to Christians. And Christians, you're going to suffer. Christians are going to have, they're going to have a trouble, calamity, persecution, hunger. You're going to feel destitute. There's going to be danger. You might even die. But despite all these things, the text goes on to say, we have, look at me, overwhelming victory in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. That's the truth. You know, Jesus, I love Jesus. Keeps you thinking, doesn't he? He's a sneaky Jesus. He didn't live up to, to, to people's expectations of how he was going to meet us. You know, as this mighty king in a castle with a sword. Instead, he shows up in a barn with some goats and, I don't know, some chickens and a few horses or something to a peasant virgin and a doubting carpenter named Joseph in this little nothing town. Folks have always had a warped perspective on who Jesus is and what he did. Most certainly, all of us can agree that our expectations on how he's going to show up in our life are not what we always expected. I could probably go up and down these aisles right now, back and forth on these seats, and ask you how, I want to know your grace story. How did Jesus meet you? You know? And it would be different. It would be an amazing group of stories here. Well, we don't have time necessarily to do all that, but I will say this. It doesn't come as a surprise, since I'm standing up here yelling at you, that I'm a preacher. And so, every single week, I study God's Word, and I pray, and I prepare to feed people with God's Word. And I have expectations. I had expectations of tonight. I have expectations for every single weekend that we gather. And there are pastors all around the world, and we differ in a lot of different things. We even differ in our theology. We differ in our practice. We differ in our style. But I can tell you right now that I can speak for almost every pastor in the whole world right here, right now, on this one thing. There's not a pastor who's ever been in a pulpit that hasn't had these thoughts that this weekend, oh, this weekend, it's going to be a Billy Graham crusade up in here. That's what we all want. We, we think this is the weekend, and we pray that way. If this is the weekend, that, that the place is going to be packed. And, and we're gonna, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to preach God's word with power and authority, and, and people are going to flood down to the front, and they're going to repent of their sin, and they're going to realize their need for Jesus, and they're going to be weeping and crying, and, 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 and they're, gonna, they're all going to turn out to be pastors and missionaries, and God is good. It's going to happen this week, right? Yeah. And most often, that's not how it happens. But that's my expectation. We've been very fortunate at this church. God has been so good to this church. Over the years, we've seen a couple hundred people come to know Jesus in our service gatherings and be baptized. Like, it's been awesome. People do get saved here in our church, for sure. But that's not really the way Jesus shows up all the time. Church is awesome and we should come and gather and learn and grow and encourage one another and pray for each other. That's why we gather in church buildings and parking lots and sides of hills and out on lakes and wherever Christians would gather. We're supposed to do that for sure. The Bible tells us not to neglect the gathering together of the saints. But most often... 
Jesus doesn't meet people in that setting. Most often, people are met by Jesus out there somewhere in the normal flow of life. Jesus met me powerfully in Pat's hospital room. It made me see an invisible God. Visible. I saw him. I saw him in the person of Pat Walsh. But several years before that, I met Jesus in the den of sin. It was far from a church. It was in a car dealership. Car dealership known for its lies and cheating and all that stuff that you have in your mind about car salesmen, I have news for you. It's true. It's true. It's bad. And I was part of that for 11 years. And in the sewer of my sin, in a place that is known for everything that is bad, Jesus showed up to me in the form of a transmission customer. This man was, his name is Brent Bickhart. And Brent was a customer there because his Plymouth Voyager minivan, the transmission went, because that's what Chrysler's do, operating as designed. But here's the thing, when your transmission's shot, that's expensive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, Ricky. Oh yeah, I know right now. The buttermobile, y'all need to pray for the buttermobile. But you know, it's amazing when I ask the guy, what are you in here for? He says, oh, I'm getting my transmission fixed. I said, how much is that? He said, $2,500. You gotta remember this guy, he wasn't dressed nice. You look at him, you'd think he doesn't have two nickels to rub together. But when I met him, he was walking through the lounge, the customer lounge, with his hands behind his back, whistling, <laughs> happy as could be. And I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? That wasn't even my transmission, and I started getting stressed out. It was at that point in my life that I was curious about Jesus. So our conversation went there, and he said this. He said, you're Jewish, aren't you? Go figure, with a name like Moses, that's a, that's a giveaway. He said, um, I already know the answer to this, but let me just ask you, do you have any, no, what do you, what do you think, who do you think Jesus is? And I said what every good Jewish boy would say, well, he's a good teacher, he was like a rabbi, taught, you know, the golden rule, like to be nice to people and stuff, that's all I knew. He said, okay, he's a good teacher. He said, Moses, do you have any children? I said, yes. He said, well, if you went to orientation for your child at school, you went up to the teacher, and he said, hi, I'm Mr. Johnson, and I'm God. What would you do? I don't know. He goes, well, if he was lying, would you let your daughter go to that school and let him be your teacher? Well, no. <laughs> Can't be a good teacher if he's a liar, right? He goes, right. He said, uh, what if he's just crazy? What if he thinks he's God, but he's not? Is he a good teacher? Would you let your daughter go to that class? I was like, well, no. He looked me right in the eyes and he said, or maybe he is, and you better bow. And I just started crying my eyes out right then and there. He hit me right in the face with the reality of who Jesus Christ is. And he said, you need to make a decision on Jesus. You can't leave him on the fence. You need to make a decision. I met Jesus in a car dealership. The most unexpected place you would ever think the Savior, the King of glory would show up. And that's where I met him. As the band comes up to lead us in worship before we leave tonight, 
I got to ask you this question. Where did King Jesus meet you? If you're not a Christian yet, where will he meet you? I don't know. Maybe he's meeting you right here, right now. And you can sense his spirit here tugging at your heart. Maybe he's been knocking on the door of your heart for some time. And maybe, maybe he just showed up right here tonight to welcome you into his kingdom. The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. Maybe he's showing up here tonight. Or maybe somewhere out there in the normal flow of your activities, normal flow of your relationships, when you go to work, when you go to the gym, when you go to the golf course, when you go to Home Depot, when you go to the Pet Lodge, I don't know where you go in day in and day out, but I can tell you what, Jesus is everywhere and he's meeting people in very unexpected ways. And if he's meeting you here tonight and you've, you've, you've been fighting it for some time and maybe it's Christmas Eve 2017 when you finally want to make that decision that your grandma's been praying and hoping for for 50 years, that your mom and dad has been praying for. Maybe you've been asking, Lord, where are you? Do you love me? Do you care about me? Do you hear my voice? Have you heard my prayers? Well, the answer is yes. And maybe he's tugging at your heart right now. And maybe you just want to finally put your, your authority down and lay your will down and embrace his. Make him the Lord of your life. I want to close with this one verse. It's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 10. It says this, And the one who descended, Jesus Christ, is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. The song that the worship band sang a little while ago, The King is Here, is very, very true. King Jesus didn't stay in the manger. King Jesus didn't stay on the cross. And King Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He's here right now. And he's knocking on the door of your heart. And so I just want to offer you this. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, since the first day of your life to the minute you walked into this parking lot, it means nothing. God's grace is stronger than your greatest sin, and he would welcome you with his loving arms wide open right now into his kingdom. If you would, if you would ask him for the forgiveness of your sin and ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And so I'd like to just give you that opportunity right now. And I want to make it really, really easy for you because I know it's not always easy. Because we get shy and we get scared and we start thinking people are going to judge me. That Maybe they thought I was a Christian all along and if I stood up now, they'd, I'd be embarrassed. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know what to do. Like, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I, I, I'm a missionary. I'm an elder at my church. I'm a deacon at the church. I sing in the worship band. I... I graduated from seminary or Bible college and everyone thought I was a Christian, but if I stood up now and said yes to Jesus, I'd be embarrassed. Better to be embarrassed than to not have eternal life. But to make it easy for you, I'm going to ask that everybody would bow their head right now. And I'm really asking you to bow your head like, don't look. Do not look. Spirit of God, I just pray that you would get rid of every single possible distraction in here right now that would keep someone from making the most important decision of their eternity. Lord, we've heard you knock on our doors tonight. 
For those of us that have answered that door, we're so very thankful. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for showing us this much, much better life than the one we had before you. Lord, none of us can rightly describe how good our life is after saying yes. We all have to live our own life out. We have to work out our salvation on our own because the better life after Jesus is different for me than it is for everybody else. And so we can't prove it. We can't drag people into heaven. It's just you that has to do this. So, Lord, we, we hear you knocking. With all heads bowed, I just want to say the invitation to be part of God's eternal family is presented to you right now. And a simple yes would be represented by raising your hand to just say, yes, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior, and I want to be part of your family. So just raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Four people, five people, praise God. Thank you, Lord. We give Jesus a hand for the new members of our family. If you made that decision, then I just want to ask you to meet with me before you leave. I'd like for you to, if you can't meet with me and you see me yapping, that gentleman at the door back there, Jay, if you'd see him and let him know about the decision you've made tonight, we would like to pray with you personally. Lord, I thank you for tonight's gathering. I thank you, Lord, that even though it's been over 730,000 days since you graced this planet in Bethlehem, that we still feel you here just as strong as you ever were. We know that you're here. We know that you love us. We know you're still on mission. We know that we're part of that. And we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for those that you saved tonight. Not those that were looking for you or even deserve it, but those that you love, that you reached down from heaven and save them forever. We praise you, King Jesus. We praise you, King Jesus. We praise you, King Jesus. Praise you, King Jesus. We praise you. All of us come to our feet. Let's worship the Lord. Under the stars, under your creation, Lord, tonight, we gather to bring you praises. We will sing songs to you, Lord, for you are worthy and you are strong and you are God. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.